But here we are, we're, we're on to lecture two, uh, Science and the Disenchantment of Nature. And look, for this lecture, I'm afraid we're going to have a bit of a primer in Hume's uh, argument on miracles, but it, it, uh, you'll see where I'm going with that. So uh, I make some apology for that. I want to come back then to Hume's famous lecture on miracles. Not, I hasten to add, because the world stands in need of yet another tired analysis of this overworked section of Hume's essay, but I want to draw your attention to how I think the argument really works, and this hasn't really been much remarked upon. And then I'll go on to show how the argument has become a model for a very common way in which we understand about modernity and progress. Now, Hume's essay of miracles, for those of you that you know Hume, is divided into two sections. And in the first section, we find the logical argument of which Hume is so proud and which purports to establish that we are never justified in accepting testimony to a miraculous event. And much ink has been spilled on this argument. Section two has received far less attention because it seems to be mostly additional uh, considerations and miscellaneous historical materials that lend support to the primary argument of section one. That's really not helping, is it? Um, my suggestion is that Hume's real justification for disbelieving miracles and miracle reports, and this is one that he shares with his modern philosophical successors, is not in fact the ingenious and much admired philosophical argument of section one, but is in fact tucked away in section two of, of miracles among the apparently minor historical considerations. And I won't keep you in suspense, here it is. So, it forms a strong presumption against all supernatural and, and miraculous relations that they are observed chiefly to abound amongst ignorant and barbarous nations or if a civilised people has ever given admission to any of them, that people will be found to have received them from ignorant and barbarous ancestors. Now what we have here is a blanket reason to disbelieve stories about the supernatural simply because such stories are a sign of ignorance and barbarism and that they come from ignorant and barbarous nations. And in case we're in any doubt about the nature of those who produce and give credence to miracle relations, we are offered in addition monkish historians, the vulgar, ignorant people, barbarous Arabians and so on. Stated in this uncompromising way and extracted from the matrix of philosophical argumentation that Hume had embedded it in, this stark assertion looks pretty much like an unsupported prejudice expressed in an insensitive way to boot. We have long dispensed with the descriptor barbarous nations to characterise people given to supernatural beliefs. And I suspect, however, uh, most Westerners still pretty much agree with the underlying, underlying sentiment of this statement. Hume's strong presumption, in other words, continues to inform how many of us in the modern West view reports of the supernatural. To be sure, the prejudicial condescension of this stance may be disguised, and part of the disguise is the ostensible appeal to philosophical arguments of the kind that Hume elaborates in the first section of, of miracles, arguments that in fact turn out to be question-begging and fallacious, as we'll see in a moment. For now, though, I want to point out that Hume's position represents an almost complete reversal of the stance of the classical philosophers whose views we briefly touched upon in the previous lecture. Aristotle and the ancients seek to jolt us into a belief in the gods. Hume wants to jolt us out of it. So just compare Cicero on barbarous nations. There is no nation so, so brutish and barbarous as not to be imbued with the conviction that there is a God. Cicero speaks pretty much for all of antiquity when he makes this insistence. Hume seeks to persuade us to the contrary, that supernatural beliefs are the unmistakable mark of barbarism. 
These diametrically opposed perspectives do not follow on from philosophical arguments, I would suggest, but rather they motivate such arguments and they are the starting point of them. The judgments that we make about cultures and historical epochs, judgments not made from nowhere, but from the perspective of our own historical moment, are at least partly based on stories we tell ourselves about our own history. In Hume's case, the key narrative that assures him of the privileged status of his own perspective is a simple narrative of historical progress. Now, whereas Hume's miracles argument is typically assumed to be a philosophical argument, my suggestion is then that the real work is done by the assumption of historical progress that more or less sits in the background. And part of the reason I think this is that the philosophical arguments of the first section of, of miracles are not very good ones, and I'm going to spend a little while in explaining why. Not because I'm interested in demolishing the philosophical argument, because I'm interested in showing how the assumptions that inform that argument are very informative. So let's move to the first section of Of Miracles and Hume's philosophical argument. As already noted, contemporary philosophers have focused most of their attention on the first section of Hume's argument, and they regard it as Hume's most original contribution to the discussion. I think the elements of the argument are worth revisiting because at virtually every step, they illustrate some interesting and contentious feature of the contemporary philosophical perspective on these issues. Hume realises at the outset that the business of taking on miracle reports is likely to be an endless task if each report is to be evaluated on its own merits. So he's seeking a principled approach that will enable him to discredit all such reports without taking the trouble to investigate each one. He's looking, in other words, for a silver bullet. And here's how he sets up the argument and why he's looking for a silver bullet. He thinks he's discovered an argument, at least with the wise and learned, that will be an everlasting check to all kinds of superstitious delusion and will be useful as long as the world endures. Now, I actually think his silver bullet argument is in the second part of Of Miracles, and it's the distinction between the civilised and the barbarous. But he's going to argue that his silver bullet is, in fact, the philosophical argument. OK. So let's begin, then, with Hume's argument. We're going to start with a couple of prefaces, uh, uh, his premises. And the first is that a wise man proportions his belief to the evidence. I'll just take you through the argument and I'll come back and consider each one of these in turn, okay? Then he gives us a definition of miracles. It's a violation of the law of nature by some invisible agent. And now the key thing that comes, to, this leads us to the conclusion as to why we should never believe in, never believe in a miracle. And I'll explain this one, in, in, but, but let's read it for the moment. As a firm and unalterable experience has established these laws, the proof against the miracle from the very nature of the fact is as entire as any argument from experience can possibly be imagined. So here's how the argument works. What is a law of nature? It's really a summary of constant observations that people make. Everyone in the world sees the sun rise every day. Well, strictly it doesn't rise because the Earth's rotating, but you, you get my point, right? Everyone sees that. It's part of our constant experience, and that's where we get laws of nature from. So if anyone comes and tells you that one day the sun didn't rise, what you need to do is to weigh up that one piece of testimony to the fact that the law of nature is established by the testimony of millions and millions of people and millions and millions of instances. So he says, the wise man proportions his belief to the evidence. Never ever believe the miracle report because insofar as it's about a violation of a law of nature and a law of nature is established by the witness of countless uh, witnesses, witness of countless, the testimony of countless witnesses, you should never ever believe testimony to a miracle. And then a couple of other points. A miracle then can never be proved to be the foundation of a system of religion. Uh, and then the problem is that if you've got different religions all claiming they're miracles, they can't all be true. So that's just an added little kicker at the end. That the, the, the religions all cancel each other out anyway. 
Now, it turns out that every single step of this argument is tendentious. Uh, and I should say again, my primary focus in this lecture is not to critique Hume's argument, um, but I do want to show how, as I've said, it's illustrative of a common approach to the question of the supernatural, and it's worth pointing out briefly what's problematic with every step of this argument. So let's start with the first premise, a wise man believes, his proportion, uh, believes in proportion to the evidence. Now, in fact, amongst philosophers, there's a long-standing argument on what is called the ethics of belief. And it's precisely on this question of whether it is ever justified to believe something without having convincing evidence for its truth. In various ways, philosophers such as Blaise Pascal, Immanuel Kant, Soren Kierkegaard, William James have all argued that there are occasions on which uh, not only is it permissible to believe in the absence of evidence, but we are obliged to do so. Indeed, what these thinkers propose is that the most important things in life actually require convictions in the absence of adequate evidence. Added to this, as we've already seen, for a philosopher like Thomas Reed, there are certain first principles that we need to accept without proof if we are going to know anything at all. And contemporary philosophers such as Alvin Plantinga have argued that belief in God is just one such basic belief. Now, I think there's something to all of these arguments, and I'm going to come back to them this afternoon if we have time in our discussion. For now, though, it, I suffice it to say that it highlights a, a deficiency in Hume's argument. Many philosophers agree that there are circumstances under which it's actually impossible to achieve the truth. We risk the truth if we're not prepared to believe things without uh, convincing evidence. Second is Hume's definition of a miracle, which seems to be relatively straightforward and uncontroversial. But it's important to note that it assumes there is such a thing as a law of nature, at least in the sense that Hume and early modern natural philosophers used it. But this conception of laws of nature did not come into existence until Descartes invented it in the 17th century. This means that for early historical actors who observed miracles or gave credence to miracle accounts, they were not operating, they could not be operating indeed, with this conception of a miracle because it depends on a conception of a law of nature that it did not exist. Now Hume here is operating with what I call a standard bait and switch move that we see operative in the philosophy of religion consistently and involves op offering a stipulative definition for some notion or doctrine and then going on to discuss it without being too scrupulous about whether it actually maps on to the historical tradition that putatively subscribed to it. So, as I'm saying, people in the past could not have subscribed to this notion of miracle because the concept of laws of nature didn't exist. The bait and switch move also is the basis of Pascal's complaint about the God of philosophers and the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. So the God that takes part in philosophical discussions is actually not the God of the Judeo-Christian tradition, or the Christian tradition at least. Now again, um, this is something I'll come back to next week uh, when I talk about the emergence, the very emergence of a conception of the supernatural. Now it's worth saying in any case that the conception of laws of nature that Hume's operating with was, uh, was then and remains controversial. It is arguably a historically contingent idea, as I've argued myself, that came into existence at a certain time. Uh, and if contemporary philosophers like Nancy Cartwright are correct, it's an idea that may well already be past its use-by date. In addition, moreover, the modern idea that nature is governed by inviolable laws... Was that Nancy Cartwright? Yes. Yes, okay. Nancy, yeah, Nancy okay. Cartwright, as in yeah. how the laws of physics lie. And Nancy is, I think she's living in Oxford, so anyway, that's, that's by the by. But um, yeah, so Nancy Cartwright's quite keen on understanding the fact that, uh, that laws of nature come into existence with a theological, interestingly, with a theological justification in, in the 17th century. Um, at, at, any rate, at any rate, so in addition, the modern idea that nature is governed by inviolable laws of nature is precisely the kind of unquestioned background assumption that is part of our modern mythology. And Wittgenstein, interestingly, is very good on this. So he says, the basis of the whole modern view of the world lies in the illusion that the so-called laws of nature are explanations of natural phenomena. So he says people stop at natural laws as something that's unassailable, as the ancients did um, 
at God and fate. So we need to question these fundamental assumptions, the idea that there are such things as laws of nature. As I've argued, it's a historically contingent idea. We tend to take it for granted in our discussions of the supernatural, but this is something that needs to be inter interrogated and, and looked at more closely. An interesting part of the problem, and we'll see this again next week, is that the very concept of nature and supernatural are also part of this contingent historical tradition. Okay. It's worth saying, actually, incidentally, in spite of this meticulous definition, when we read Hume, he actually conflates a whole range of categories, supernatural, miraculous, marvellous, prodigious, and extraordinary. He doesn't even stick to this, but, but that's kind of by the by. Okay, moving on. So here's the question of the balance of testimonies. Okay, so the testimony to the miracle is always in the minority when you've got the testimony to the laws of nature. And what Hume proposes here is a simple quantitative weighing up of completing testimonies. And that, this is what the argument looks like. By its very nature, that's what a, a law of nature will always outweigh the competing testimony. But in fact, there are important qualitative factors. As already noted, what's at stake in disbelieving or believing is surely a consideration. Uh, as Pascal famously pointed out, if by believing you have little to lose and everything to gain, the, potent, the prudential course of action is to believe. And I'll come back again to this this afternoon when I talk about um, the, the, uh, the will to believe. It's not irrational to use another example to bet on a long odd shot in a horse race, even though the probability is against winning, because what you stand to win is disproportionately larger. Okay, so um, William James makes a similar point in his classic essay, The Will to Believe, arguing that sometimes we can risk the truth by not believing uh, in the absence of sufficient evidence. Crucially, moreover, the testimony of some people will weigh more heavily with us than that of others. Thus, we might place more weight on the testimony of experts, on those whom we judge to be sober and truthful, on friends and loved ones, and of course, we can hardly discount our own personal experiences, which we are also likely, not surprisingly, to place special weight upon, even if that experience is unavailable to others. So it's not simply a numbers game, that's the point. Uh, okay. A miracle can never be proved, so to be, to be the foundation of a system of religion. And here I simply want to point to the unexamined assumption that religion is a system of beliefs that rests upon foundational propositions for, for which a particular form of justification is required. Miracles in this scheme of things are intended to act as proofs. But like Hume's stipulative definition of laws of nature, the very idea that Christianity was a religion constituted by its propositional content, was also a historical product of the early modern period, the 17th century, and not a notion to which pre-modern individuals subscribed. So here again we have the bait and switch move being deployed. As for the idea of miracles as proofs of a religion, there was certainly a lot of that kind of talk around in the 17th and 18th centuries, and this is why Hume mounts his argument then. Um, Again, though, historically, this evidentiary understanding of the function of miracles had not been foundational in establishing the truth of Christian beliefs. In the Synoptic Gospels, just to take a simple example, Jesus performs miracles because of the already existing faith of his audience and not to elicit it. Even in John's Gospel, where conversely, it is often the performance of miracles that produces faith, this is not necessarily regarded as entirely desirable. Hence, those who demand a miracle are chastised unless you see one with signs and wonders, you will not believe. Now, this is not a point I'm going to labor, and I've discussed it elsewhere in some detail, but it does relate to the very final argument of Hume's philosophical argument against miracles, and the, that argument goes like this. Miracles are supposed to serve as evidence for the propositional beliefs that constitute religion, and all religions claim to be true based on their own proprietary miracles. However, the various religions understood in this propositional sense posit conflicting truth claims. It follows that either the miracles appealed to as evidence for competing religions must not have occurred, or even if they did, they cannot logically serve to guarantee the truth 
of the incompatible systems of religious religions. Religious religions, religions is what I'm trying to say here. Now, the difficulty is that this whole argument rests on the assumption that we are to understand religions as mutually incompatible belief systems. But again, the idea of plural religions constituted by beliefs and practices was a new conception that mapped poorly onto the historical phenomena that it was meant to represent. As for the idea that mutually competing, competing beliefs necessarily cancel each other out and render the entire business of religion dubious, it's worth re recalling Descartes' uh, judgment on the state of philosophy. Here's the quote from Descartes. I saw that it had been cultivated, cultivated for many ages by the most distinguished men, and yet there is not a single matter within its sphere which is not still in dispute. Now, contemporary philosophers have belatedly realised that this situation is, is self-worthy of philosophical assessment. And philosophy of disagreement, the realisation that philosophy is, is wrapped with fundamental disagreement about the most basic issues, philosophers have finally cottoned on to this um, uh, in the philosophy of disagreement. Needless to say, perhaps, philosophers have been reluctant to conclude on the basis of the undeniable fact that many of them hold mutually exclusive positions that the whole enterprise of philosophy is thereby fatally undermined. The so-called steadfast view, for example, maintains that it is rational to stick to your guns even in the face of strong peer disagreement, and thus philosophy continues on its merry way. So, even if we do regard religions as systems of propositional beliefs, which I think is a highly dubious contention, uh, but Hume seems to think this, the implications of disagreement among them is not as destructive as we might sometimes imagine. Before returning to Hume's historical argument against miracles, I want to highlight one prominent principle that undermines much of what is being proposed, and that is that there are certain concepts in play here. Belief, laws of nature, supernatural, religion, and these are treated as if they're unproblematic, self-evident, trans-historical, universal, whereas in fact they are themselves the products of a specific time and place. The standard philosophical move here is to provide stipulative definitions to try to stabilise these phenomena and then move on to the arguments. But the fundamental question is whether these things exist at all and whether the historical actors who are imagined to subscribe to them did so in anything like the terms that we encounter in the philosophical discussions of them. But even if we leave aside all of these objections, Hume still has a significant residual problem, and it is this. If we are serious about being guided by the weight of testimony, which is the key aspect of his argument, we're serious about that, and we, we leave aside, as we, if we leave aside individual cases of miracle reports to look at the overall historical pattern, there is in fact overwhelming testimony to the supernatural leaving aside the problematic aspects of that, that conception, from every culture and from every historical period and from the bulk of philosophical thinkers. Right? The, the weight of the evidence for the supernatural is overwhelmingly against the Humean position, and that's what's disguised in the argument. As we saw at the beginning, so Hume needs to find a way to discount the weight of testimony, which arguably is the whole principle of his... Uh, uh, the, the first section of the argument. So, why would we do this? How does Hume discount the general weight of that testimony and sh or does he, how does he shift tension um, away from it? And as we saw at the beginning of the lecture, here is the silver bullet move. He does so by drawing a line between barbarous and civilised nations and proposing an inevitable historical progression from a barbarous past to a civilised present, with Europe and Britain in particular representing the pinnacle of civilization. Reports of the supernatural, if we buy into this story, will thus become, by their very nature, marks of ignorance and barbarism. But, but by the same token, scepticism about the supernatural while in historical terms a minority position, this is what Hume wants to avoid uh, making obvious, this now becomes a sure sign of being in the, in, the in the vanguard 
of human advancement. This argument, based on the assumption of historical progress, is the ultimate trump card, which to a degree renders superfluous, in fact, any philosophical arguments about relative probabilities of particular events. So this is the trump card that really renders all of the rest of the discussion largely moot. We no longer speak in terms of civilised and barbarous nations. Nonetheless, this dichotomy, informed by a notion of differential social progress, continues to frame our understanding of worldviews that invoke the supernatural. The narrative of historical progress, uh, the narr sorry, lost my place here. The narrative of historical progress in which naturalistic science will come to assume a central role. So science is key here. Stories about science are key. The, na the narrative of historical progress in which naturalistic science will come to assume a central role is the foundational myth of modernity that constrains our experience of nature and prejudices us against giving credence to rumours of the transcendent. Okay. So that's really the key myth of modernity, although we don't talk in those terms anymore because we're a bit more sensitive. Okay, so let me talk briefly about progress. Hume offers us an early version of the conviction that history has brought us to a moment when in our intellectual maturity, we can no longer countenance tales of the supernatural. The world we now inhabit, he, he assures us, is quite different from the first histories of all nations, which I quote here, in which the frame of nature, as he puts it, seems to operate on an entirely different set of principles. Now, I should stress again here that I'm not suggesting that David Hume single-handedly invented a story about secular modernity that everyone else subsequently brought into, but rather that he exemplifies what will become a standard pattern that will form a whole range of disciplines taking in sociology, anthropology, history, and biblical criticism, and these shape general theories of secularization and modernization. Enlightenment historians and pioneering social scientists who came after Hume would thus elaborate this basic distinction between the primitive and the present by setting out various stages of historical development. Perhaps the best known version of this is Auguste Comte's three stages model where he starts off with the religious or theological stage, this moves to a brief metaphysical stage, and then we end up with the scientific stage. Okay? So all our forms of knowledge, according to Comte, ineluctably move through. This is how history works. This is the direction in which it moves. It goes like that. Subsequent versions of this historical traje trajectory would offer variations on this theme. So if we move to the social sciences, the pioneering anthropologist E.B. Tyler, savagery, barbarism, civilization. That's the pattern. Uh, so professor of anthropology here at Oxford, instrumental in setting up the Pitt Rivers Museum. And what the Pitt Rivers Museum is, if you go and look at its displays, what it's designed to show is precisely the, the historical progress, if you look at the artefacts, they're, they're, they're meant to represent exactly, uh, or embody exactly that kind of, of change. So he, just to quote from Tyler's um, primitive culture, you can see where that's going, and I quote here, uh, by long experience of the course of human society, the principle of development in culture has become so ingrained in our philosophy that ethnologists of whatever school hardly doubt that whether by progress or degradation, savagery and civilization are connected as lower and higher stages of one formation. So like Kant, Tyler specifies these three stages of social development. The wild Australian was actually his exemplar of savagery and the refined Englishman of civilization. So there you go. The stage of savagery was characterised by animism and belief in its spiritual beings, which for Tyler arose out of primitive man's attempt to understand what we would now regard as scientific questions. In time, the false answers to these questions would be replaced by true scientific ones. Contemporary belief in the supernatural was for Tyler a vestigial survival of an earlier and more primitive age. Now, James George Fraser, we're staying with uh, sociology, uh, sorry, anthropology. Three stages, 
uh, again, and we've got the same thing, moving from the religious to the scientific stage. I think these guys got their three stages from Joachim of Fiori, who in the Middle Ages also had three stages of history, an eschatological vision based on the, the Trinity. But that's, I'll need to do more work on that. That's just a guess. So Fraser, he's the author of The Golden Bow. He was inspired to take up anthropology by reading Tyler. Um, at the urging, interestingly, of the biblical scholar William Robertson Smith, and biblical criticism is going to be a key part of this progressive story, and I'll talk about that next week. Um, actually, I'll talk about it today because I'm getting on the one soon. Uh, so, within the, dis within the discipline of anthropology, these progressivist frameworks were eventually to give way in the 20th century to functionalist interpretation. So, anthropologists are not going to sign up to this anymore. Right? Um, the sanguine view of progress characteristic of the earlier models was also dealt a major blow in the wake of the modern savagery of the world wars in the 20th century. Yet the underlying narrative of a universal progression from a world filled with supernatural beliefs uh, to one in which those have been displaced by scientific ones continues to inform the contemporary rhetoric about the respective social roles of science and religion and I will argue, shape our modern scepticism about the supernatural in the social sciences. For all that contemporary anthropology might, present, might presently disavow the, progressive, the progressivist prejudices of its progenitors, I, want, I wonder if its, if its legitimacy and authority rest on the tacit assumption that somehow it sits outside the stream of history and occupies an Archimedean vantage point that enables, us, that enables it to treat other cultures in an objective and scientific way. And it's certainly very interesting, uh, while of all the academic disciplines, um, of all the academic disciplines, anthropologists are the most likely to be studying cultures. Uh, it, sorry, let me read that again. It's certainly interesting, while of all the academic disciplines, anthropologists are the most likely to be studying cultures that acknowledge supernatural realities, they themselves are, curiously, perhaps, the least religiously committed of all the academic disciplines. So there we have it. So in the, it's, it's very interesting in the science versus religion stuff, the assumption that scientific training will prejudice people against religion does not seem to show up in the stats. Um, and what's not mentioned there, interestingly, is history, um, which I, I think even outpoints anthropology on the disbelief scale. So people in the humanities and social sciences are far less believing than people uh, in the sciences. But I'll, that, that's really, i just just throwing that in as a kind of interesting side point. Now note that in, in these original schemes, these three part type progressive schemes, science itself is not the engine of progress, but it's rather the end point of progress. The pattern of human development is instead ascribed to inexorable laws analogous to the laws that obtain in the physical world. In each of these schemes, moreover, the science of the scientific stage of development is meant only in the most general sense, not least because prior to the mid-19th century, science tended to note, to note something more like systematic knowledge. In the second half of the 19th century, as our modern conception of science began to coalesce, we do begin to see attempts to apply this new idea of science retrospectively to the models of historical development that I've spoken about. This period also sees the emergence of two very similar modern myths that I'll talk about in much more detail next week. One that says there's an enduring conflict between science and religion, and another that speaks about a struggle between naturalism and supernaturalism. And these two are key myths, key myths of modernity, that the origins of which I'll, exp I'll talk about next week. But just to give you a quick, a, a quick intro, the best known of these attempts to construct a, a, a progress myth that, that implicates science and religion comes from the progenitors of the so-called conflict thesis between science and religion, John William Draper and Andrew Dixon White. And you get, here's John Draper. History, and if we're talking about uh, the history of science, it's not just about discoveries, it's about an ongoing warfare uh, between science and religion. And if you look at the title, the, you know, the clue is in the title. 
Draper, incidentally, had already set out a progressivist account of European history in a work called History of the Intellectual Development of Europe, and that's an 1863 book. And interestingly, in his Human Physiology, 1856, now in this latter book, he rehearses the common view, interesting that Australians sit on the lowermost rung of the human race, um, and English scientists sit at the very top. So here is Newton and the indigenous Australian. And so we need to study the races, and we see there's a, an advance from infancy through childhood manhood, and thus in the scientific age, we are the grown-ups and the people who believe in the supernatural uh, at the childish end. In a similar fashion, Andrew Dixon White, uh, president of Cornell, in the other classic testament to the conflict thesis, reduced the stages of history just to two. More and more I saw the struggle between science and dogmatic theology as a struggle between two epochs in the evolution of human thought the theological and the scientific. So there you have it, the epochs, uh, and we've moved away from religion into science. Now, at the same time that the conflict model was being worked out, an analogous historical schema, couched in terms of a transition from supernaturalism to naturalism, was being worked out by Thomas Henry Huxley and others. Now, many contemporary philosophical advocates of scientific naturalism have a similar story, which they think is based on the history of science, but it's not. Modern science is, se is said to have become increasing, as modern science is said to have increasingly argued that only natural or physical forces are at work in the world. So scientific descriptions of nature will now speak about a causally closed universe precluding the possibility of any, anything other than purely natural agency being at work in nature. And I'm going to speak more about that next week. Finally then, the most persuasive of all general narratives of modernity to reflect this religion to science transition has been secularisation theory. In what has been perhaps the most influential account and most sophisticated account, I think, of the emergence of secular modernity. Uh, Max Weber famously spoke about, in this, again, famous essay, Science of, uh, as a Vocation, about the disenchantment of the world, literally the demagicification, you can see why people have used the word disenchantment, of the world. The fate of our times, as you can see there, the fate of our times, he says, is characterised by a rationalisation and intellectualisation above all, and above all by the disenchantment of the world. This enchantment consists in the modern conviction that there are no mysterious, incalculable forces that come into play, but rather one can, in principle, master everything by calculation. Uh, and as for the individual person, the bearing of man has been disenchanted and denuded of its mystical but inwardly genuine plasticity here. And Charles Taylor echoes this notion in his conception of the individuals who are no longer porous and permeable to uh, forces beyond them. Now, Weber's thinking on these questions was profound and far less simplistic than, than the preceding anthropological constructions or subsequent, or subsequent secularisation theories for that matter, religions did not represent a primitive stage in human development, but rather in some forms, Protestant Christianity in particular, were themselves agents of secularisation. And this is the key point for Weber, religion itself, bears, religion bears within itself the seeds of secularisation. Religions were also subject to the processes of rationalisation and intellectualisation, another key, that religions participate in this, this process itself. Moreover, moreover, while Weber was far from being a religious apologist, he nonetheless saw significant downsides to the disenchantment of the world. Now, modern secularisation theories, like, anthrop like the anthropological structuring of history, um, often have, uh, th they have three can often conflated components, and this is kind of secularisation theory 101, so I apologise for that, who, who, those of you who are familiar with it. 
But the three aspects of this, there's a descriptive component that says when we look at the world, what we see is a decline in religious belief and practice. There's a predictive component that says this is how inevitably it will be. There is a kind of inexorable direction to historical development. Okay, so this decline is, is explained by historical laws and that's where we're going to end up. And then there's a normative component that says, and this is a really good thing that all of this is happening. And sociological accounts of secularization routinely conf conflate these three elements, okay? The descriptive, which putatively describes what's happening in northern European, some northern European societies. The claim that this is actually an exitable historical pattern, they borrowed this, this is borrowed from the, a, a Marxist account of, well, going, let's go back to Hegel, a Hegelian account of how we understand historical development. And, and Marx and, and Weber will, will both subscribe to aspects of that uh, historic, his, historical view. And then the normative component, that this is actually something we think is a good idea, okay? It's really good that this is happening. And as I say, these, these three aspects are often conflated. Right, where am I? Here, okay. So that is to say they purport to describe a process in which religious claims become less plausible, and to the extent that they decline, this is a consequence of inexorable historical processes. Uh, and a, in a, a fully secularised world is predicted for all societies. And here we get this, this is a kind of standard quote about the predictive aspect of secularisation theory. It's going to die out, why? As a, because scientific knowledge will displace it. Okay, and why, and this is supposed to be a good thing because it's associated with genuine human progress. And just to give you another pretty crude version, You've got the, here's, here's the notion of the conflict between science and religion and the fact that that's, it's a pretty good thing. Uh, science is going to come out on top because it works and religion doesn't. Now, it's true, of course, that over the last 30 years, each of these aspects of secularisation theory, the descriptive, the predictive and the normative, uh, has faced very serious challenges. Nonetheless, the idea of an inexorable historical process that leads to disenchantment and the withering away of religion remains, I think, the dominant mode of understanding Western modernity. Marxism had its day, but it was along similar lines in some respects. Now, it's important to understand um, that many of those sympathetic to religion also subscribe to this kind of narrative that, that divides a desacralized present from the past. In the last century, uh, the biblical scholar Rudolf Bultmann famously proposed a project for the demythologization of the New Testament message. And here's probably Bultmann's most famous quote. It's impossible to, it's a, it's a little bit like, um, it's a little bit like the toaster and Chekhov. But anyway, it's impossible to use the electric light and the wireless to avail ourselves of modern medical and surgical discoveries. Uh, and at the same time to believe in the New Testament world of spirits and miracles. We might think we can manage it in our own lives, but to expect others to do so is to make the Christian faith unintelligible and unacceptable to the modern world. So there's Bultmann. Oxford's own Bultmann light, that might be unkind, but let me say... Uh, Oxford's own theologian, John Macquarie, the Lady Margaret Professor of Divinity here in the 70s and 80s, took a similar line. The way of understanding miracle that appears to break in the natural order and to supernatural inventions belongs to a mythical outlook. It cannot commit itself in a post-mythical climate of thought. The traditional conception of miracle is irreconcilable with our modern understanding of both science and history. So I make the point here that the Humean myth, as it were, that we find then subsequently in the anthropological structurings of history and in the Weberian secularization theory is one that's been taken on board within some aspects of the Christian theological tradition itself. Okay, I come back to Bultmann because Bultmann is, is, is very interesting and, and, and he's often misunderstood on this point. Bultmann does not actually subscribe to the progressive stages model of history in asserting that we've moved from a mythical world picture to a more non-mythical scientific one. He doesn't say that at all. Rather, we've exchanged one mythical worldview for another. 
So here's just a couple of quotes for Bortman that make, make the point. I should have given you a bit. So Bortman is a New Testament, 18th, 20th century New Testament scholar and, and theologian. Um, so I don't replace mythical thinking with the thinking of an, object, of an objectifying science. This is to the other great giant of German theology in the 20th century, Karl Barth, who had initially misunderstood him on this. And then everyone knows that the results of science are relative and that any world picture worked out yesterday, today, and, and tomorrow, or tomorrow, can never be definitive. So this is because for Bultmann, objectifying science is our modern mythology. And Bultmann's point is that, that privileging any mythology or worldview will be arbitrary. So he's not suggesting that, that we, we take the myth out of Christianity and then re-mythologise it in terms of science. Rather, he says, we are in the grip currently of another mythology, and that mythology is science. And therefore, that mythology is just as arbitrary as a New Testament mythology. Which is, you know, you've got a three-tier universe with God lives up here and Satan is down here, and you've got all of that stuff, right? For Bultmann, these are equally arbitrary. So here's the question, what's the program? What's the program? So writing in the middle decades of the last century, Bultmann was not sanguine about a return to an enchanted world because in his view, modern minds are inescapably shaped by scientific understanding. So here's what he has to say. It's impossible to repristinate a past world picture by sheer resolve especially a mythical world picture, now that all our thinking is irrevocably formed by science. The key words there, formed. Our thinking is formed by science. Now, I agree that we cannot return to a mythical worldview, a three-storied world with the earth at the centre of the heavens above and the underworld beneath, or a medieval worldview, for that matter. But I'm not sure that a partial return to something like an enchanted world is out of the question. And this is because I'm not convinced that there's anything irrevocable or inescapable about the scientific formation that Bullman refers to as shaping our contemporary worldview. And this is for three reasons. First of all, the world is actually more enchanted than we often think. And those, who hold, those of us who hold that the modern West, sorry, and those of us who hold that all of us in the modern West are constrained by a naturalistic and scientific worldview, in a way, just need to get out more. So the reenchantment of the world as I see it, sorry, the reenchantment of the world or the persistence of enchantment is a sociological fact. I'm going to talk about this more next week, but here's just to give you an idea. Um, surprising as it may seem, America has more witches than Presbyterians. There is, is, what the sociological evidence shows us is there's a remarkable persistence of enchantment in the modern world. It's just that people like us don't, don't see it. And it is a different form of enchantment, I think, than the enchantment of the past, but it's still there. So part of the myth of secularisation is that we live in a totally disenchanted world and we don't. So that, that's the first point. Second, the naturalistic worldview of modern science is not just one myth amongst other myths. So we've got first century myths, we've got myths of other cultures, we've got our contemporary myth. I don't think our modern science myth is one myth amongst others, but it's a significant outlier. It's an exception in the world of myths. So contesting it does not leave us in the position of arbitrarily choosing among a smorgasbord of other myths. It's rather a matter of gaining an appreciation of just how historically and culturally exceptional our scientific worldview is and seeing if it might be possible to recalibrate it and bring it back to the rest of the field, as it were. Third, those of us who subscribe to a naturalistic scientific worldview uh, do so not so much because they are formed by science, and this is Bultmann's point, we are formed by science, this is why we cannot accept 
uh, aspect of the mythological world. It's not so much that we are formed by science, but we are formed by myths that have been attached to science. So our formation in relation to understanding the supernatural is not formed by science per se, it's formed by myths that we, we hold and believe about science. The task then, putting it simplistically, uh, it, to, to advert to Bultmann's program, the task then is less the demythologization of religious worldviews than the demythologization of science itself. And to be very clear, this does not entail skepticism about what the natural sciences are telling us about the world. It's what people think about science. It's what people believe science means that needs to be the focus of our attention. So we, again, we need to focus our skeptical attention on the modern narratives and myths that have grown up around the sciences and which place it into an, in a negative relation to the kinds of commitments that were commonplace in our own historical past and indeed remain commonplace in other cultures. It's mostly these myths that masquerade as part of the history of science that do the formative work that Bultmann referred to. Not science itself, but the myths that we believe about science. And these are the narratives that we need to scrutinise. The progressive stages of history model, albeit implicitly held. The science and religion conflict story, which is also key. And the science equals naturalism story, which is also key. And it's this last myth, in addition to the conflict myth, that I think has received less historical uh, attention than it should, the idea that science necessarily brings in its train a naturalistic worldview. And this is the myth that I'm going to be examining in more detail next Tuesday. So that's the end of this lecture. Let me just say in two sentences, this afternoon, um, it's going to be somewhat more open, but I have some input, and what that input will be about is more detail about the way in which our notions of belief have undergone historical change, and how the conceptual apparatus that we've developed, particularly in the modern philosophical tradition, ill-equips us to deal with understanding commitment to the existence of some transcendental reality. Thank you. Yeah, look, um, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that. I mean, in, in, in a way, our capacity to, our, our capacity to experience, experience beauty and wonder and the kinds of things that you've described, um, at, at one level, the, your question is an empirical one, right? And is it the case that people need to, to have some kind of religious commitment to experience those things? Empirically, the answer to that question is clearly no. Uh, and, and that would be my viewpoint. 
And I wouldn't even go as far as to say that you need some kind of religious commitment to, you know, to aesthetic beauty or the beauty of the equations. No, no, I, I, I don't see why that would be a necessary thing at all. What, what I would say, though, and again, this is simply an empirical observation, is that historically, the vast bulk of people have associated those affections with some notion of being in touch with the transcendent. Um, so, so I suppose at one level I'm completely agreeing with your point, um, but again I would make the historical observation that, that you know, it's, and, I mean, Alistair McGrath sitting right behind you in a way has made this point, that the platonic conception of truth, beauty and goodness were tr traditionally the kinds of things that went, went together. And I think that's incontest it's incontestable um, uh, his historically. The, uh, so the interesting, again, the interesting empirically testable question would be um, <clears throat> whether, and I, this is what I think in relation to art and music as opposed to science, what we do know about the past is the capacity of religious commitment to inspire great works of art. And, and it'll be interesting to see in the future, and I, I'm completely open empirically as to whether this will be the case or not, as to whether we, whether we still get such profound aesthetic productions in an absence of a sense of the transcendence. And if thinkers from Plato onwards have been right about this, you know, the answer is no. But I'm not committed at this point. It's an empirical question. Um, but, no, it's a, but, but it's a good question to ask. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, this is just a quick question. I'm, I'm wondering about the term in Salvador, Baker's term, mm -hmm. which is kind of like often typically translated as disenchantment. And I wonder if there's anything that's lost or gained in that linguistic move. Because to say, like, indeed, magically, in the Salvador, isn't exactly disenchantment. And I wonder if there's something that's being kind of sunk in there, or what is, what is gained and what is lost in translating that in? Would you have a different way of conceiving of what they were talking about if you put it in your own words? Yeah, look, I mean, it's a, it's a good question. I mean, something is always lost in translation, right? Something is always lost. And disenchantment, Disenchantment is it's a, it's a much more elegant translation, although it's far less accurate, as you, which is what you're pointing out. And I, I don't know the answer to your, I don't really know the answer to your question, because what, again, part of what happens is when historical thinkers mount a historical thesis, there develops a, a tradition around them. And so we have a Weberian notion of disenchantment, and that may be something quite difficult different to what Weber himself uh, had envisaged. There's a very interesting book recently come out by Jason Josephson Storm called The Myth of Disenchantment, where he actually looks at Weber and wants to argue that you know, Weber himself was very ambivalent, not, not merely about the, the merits of disenchantment, but what it was that it actually consisted in. And, and Storm argues, uh, not entirely, is the video still going? No, I'm not entirely... I, I, I have made up my mind about his, his thesis, but that Weber himself was far more into notions of, of what we would call enchantment or the persistence of magic in the world. Um, but, but certainly, if, to go back to that book, I do think the thesis of that book is correct, that, that many of us, I include you know, myself amongst them in a way, have overestimated the extent to which this process has taken place. And if we look hard enough, we actually find these persistences and survivals of enchantment or magic, if you want to put it that way, um, uh, all over the place. 
You think that's a, that's a very good question, and you, you, I fear you're trying to out me here as whether I'm a scientific realist or not. Um, <laughs> but uh, look, to be honest, how, how can, to answer this diplomatically, I think what, what I think people have systematically conflated with science is its usefulness and its truth. And it's, you know, it, it's a no-brainer that science is useful. And all I would say on the realist question is, I do not believe that there is any connection between the utility of a scientific theory and its truth. And we know this historically because all of the, hist all of the, all of the scientific theories of the past were useful. They did great stuff they predicted and they've subsequently been, been, been uh, replaced by other scientific theories. And this does look like I'm outing myself a little bit here. Um, I, I don't think it's crucial to. I don't think it's crucial to attack scientific realism to demythologize science. Let's put it that way. But I, I would say, um, and I'll come back to this next week. I would say that what we do need to understand about science is that its usefulness is clearly um, it, its its greatest its greatest asset. And, and perhaps again, to, so I can muddy the waters a little bit, we've been talking here about science in the, in the singular with a capital S. And of course, there are multiple sciences with multiple methods. And their access and their, uh, you know, I, I think their, their capacity to access reality varies. And the historical sciences like geology and, uh, and, and biology, I think, actually, um, are going to get us much, like, much closer to how the world really is than the highly theoretical sciences like, like physics. That would, be, that would be my view. But I'm, I'm going to get myself into trouble with the scientists if I keep talking. Um, but, uh, so, but look, it's a really good question about what... But what I would say to come back to it is that the demythologization of science is much more about how we think about its its status and its relation to our understanding of the transcendent. Yeah, good question.